I'm going to be speaking on the stone the builders rejected, the cornerstone. Those of you who know the great Renaissance sculptor and artist Michelangelo know that he is best remembered probably not only for what he did at the Sistine Chapel but for his iconic 17 feet statue of David. So three times the size of an average man. And um, there's just a picture of the top part. And the 16th century painter and architect Giorgio Vasari wrote of it, whoever has seen this work need not trouble to see any other work executed in sculpture, either in our own or in any other times. A masterpiece, especially if you look at the definition of the, the different muscles and uh, to imagine that he carved that out of a block of marble. people don't always realize that that famous masterpiece came from a piece of marble that had been twice discarded by other sculptors. Agostini de Duccio gave up on the project using the block. Ten years later, Antonio Rosalina tried to use it but decided it was too difficult to work with. And when Michelangelo started his work, it had actually been standing for 40 years. This unwanted block of marble was discarded by others, but became a masterpiece of Renaissance art. So it was rejected as useless stone by some, but it became a precious masterpiece of David. So... The rejection of David, well, I want to talk today about the rejection of the son of David. Because remember, David was the forerunner of Jesus. And Jesus was also a stone that was rejected, which subsequently became a masterpiece. Precious stone, the cornerstone. And he faced rejection and yet became the sole redeemer of mankind. 1 Peter 2 verse 4 says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. So I want to have a look at the sevenfold rejection of Jesus. Bearing in mind that he did this, he faced rejection for us. But I just want to read a few passages from the Old Testament. First, to give you some sort of background, Isaiah 28 verse 16 I'm going to read from the Brenton translation of the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek version of the Bible that was used in the time of Jesus and, in fact, is the version that is most quoted in the New Testament. And it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, even the Lord, behold, I lay for the foundations of Zion a costly stone, a choice, a cornerstone, a precious stone for its foundations, and he that believes on him shall by no means be ashamed. The Masoretic uh, says, he that believes will not make haste, which is maybe a bit obscure. So that's why uh, I use the Septuagint there, because that's actually what's quoted in the New Testament twice. He that believes in him shall by no means be ashamed. And then Psalm 118, verse 22 to 23, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then Isaiah 8, verse 14 to 15 says, He will be a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. So with that background of these prophecies that were given in the Old Testament, Let's look, as I said, at the sevenfold rejection of Jesus. Firstly, Jesus was rejected by his hometown. Remember, he was brought up in Nazareth. And it says in Matthew 13, verse 57, that when he went there, they took offense at him. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 30, says that Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. 
unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll. It says that he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and that everybody in the synagogue was looking at him. And then he said an amazing thing. After reading that passage, he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the fulfillment of that. I've come to proclaim liberty to the captives. And then he says, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do you in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum? I tell you the truth. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. That's in Lebanon. So Jesus said, although um, there were lots of widows, Elijah is sent to a widow who is in Lebanon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So the point he is making is sometimes God works in other areas because when we're familiar with someone, as Jesus said, a prophet is without honor in his hometown. But it says that the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. And they got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. So they were pretty angry. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So Jesus, uh, we are told, couldn't do many miracles there because he was limited by their unbelief. Because they said, you know, he's just the son of the carpenter. Then he was rejected by his own family, misunderstood. They actually thought that he was mad. In Mark 3, verse 20 to 21, it says that Jesus entered a house and there was such a great crowd there that his disciples and him weren't even able to eat. And when his mother and brothers heard about this, it says they went to take charge of him for they said he is out of his mind. So yeah, Jesus' family saying that he is mad didn't understand his ministry. In fact, we're told that his brothers interpreted his ministry as an attempt to gain publicity. They didn't deny that uh, Jesus was doing miraculous things, but they thought he was just, you know, trying to get popular. And it's only after his resurrection we know that James and Jude were converted and wrote two of the epistles in the, in the New Testament. But at this point, they didn't believe in him. It says, when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near in John 7, Jesus' brother said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. Because in Judea, Jerusalem was where the feast was being held. And they say, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. They tell him, go and do some miracles there. And then John goes on to say, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. After all, they grew up with him. He was just their brother. That was the understanding at that time anyway. Then thirdly, the religious leaders in the main, Jesus was reject, rejected by them. They were the very people who should have welcomed him, the people who knew the prophecies. Mark 8 verse 31, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And we see that they tried to trap him in his words. Ken was mentioning last Sunday. And they would look for a way to kill him. They bribed Judas to betray him. They ended up using false witnesses against him and they conducted what was an illegal trial because you weren't supposed to have a trial by night. And they accused him of blasphemy. And then they handed him over to the Romans because they weren't allowed to put someone to death and they demanded his death. And then they changed the charges. They told the Romans that his kingship was a threat to the Romans and that he opposed taxation. 
If you read in Luke 23, verse 2, they said, we found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. Caesar, there was a lie. Jesus, remember, it said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. But they wanted to have a charge that sounded good to the Romans. So they said, he says, we mustn't pay taxes. And by the way, he's claiming to be a king. They accused those who believed on him of being ignorant. So in John chapter 7, at that same feast of the tabernacles, they sent the temple guards to arrest him. And they come back empty-handed. And the Pharisees say, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the gods declared. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse in them. So basically they're telling them, you know, you're stupid. That's why you believe in him, because you don't actually know the law. Now, days before his crucifixion, Jesus would ride into Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry. Remember last Sunday? Uh, that's when we remembered it. It's Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, verse 7 says, They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David was a messianic title. Remember David? The son of David was going to rule the Messiah from Jerusalem. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting scripture there. I'm going to show you now. Now, firstly, and most of you are probably aware of this, Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, that's Jerusalem. Shout loud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So in fulfillment of this, where the king of Jerusalem is going to ride in on a donkey, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. But he was not only fulfilling Zechariah 9 verse 9, he's also fulfilling the Messianic Psalm 118. Psalm 118 also speaks about the rejection of the cornerstone, if you remember what we read earlier. Messianic Psalm is a psalm that was believed, and we believe as well, but at the time they believed it was a psalm that pointed to not just David who wrote it, but to his future son, the son of David, the Messiah. And so the crowd is quoting Psalm 118, verse 23, which, um, well, sorry, verse 26, where it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the house of the Lord. That's the temple, and that's where Jesus was coming in. He came in the eastern gate, which was right by the temple. It was the entrance to the temple. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But it goes on in that psalm to speak of branches in their hands. Uh, psalm 118, verse 27. And yeah, I'm reading from the, the JPS Tanakh, 1917. That's actually the Jewish translation of the Bible into English, not by Christians. And they say, the Lord is God and hath given us light. Order the festival procession with boughs, its branches, even unto the horns of the altar, again, the temple. So that same psalm, it speaks about the branches and the procession near the temple. That's exactly what the crowd is doing. And Jesus, as I said, enters the eastern gate and he's soon going to be crucified a few days later and provide a way of salvation. And verses 19 to 21 says, Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the eastern gate, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. All these amazing prophecies in Psalm 118. But then it says, 22 to 23, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. There it shows that he would be rejected, this king entering Jerusalem. 
Now, some Pharisees obviously understood the references to Psalm 118. They knew exactly why the crowd was saying that, and they took objection. And that's why in Luke 19, verse 39 to 40, it says that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They knew they were quoting the psalm about the Messiah, the son of David. Rebuke them. And Jesus responded, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, immediately after those events, we find that Jesus makes that connection to Psalm 118 clear when he will identify himself as the stone that the builders rejected. In that con context, he says, listen to another parable. It was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Jesus said, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And their response is, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at the harvest time. And we're also told by Luke that when the people heard this parable, they said, God forbid, what a terrible thing to happen. These guys not only kill the servants, they kill the very son. But Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So in the context of all those performance of Psalm 118, he adds another bit that he draws the attention to that part. And then he explains it very clearly. He says, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. So we know that that parable represented Israel. The servants that are sent by God represent the prophets whom they ill-treated. The son was referring to Jesus, and Jesus said they will kill the son. The stone will be rejected. And yeah, we see quite clearly, he predicts that the kingdom of God is taken away and given to others. And the teachers of the law understood what he was saying. Often they didn't understand his parables, but yeah, they knew exactly what he was saying because it says the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. And so days later, they would reject him as king. He came as king on the, on the donkey. The king comes to Zion. But in John 19, 14 to 15, Pilate says, here is your king. But they shouted, take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priests answered, oh, this is amazing from guys who generally hated the Romans. Now they're saying, we've only got Caesar as our king. He's not our king. Now, the apostles were aware of those passages and their meaning as well. After all, they'd been schooled by Jesus. And so after the establishment of the church, after Pentecost, we know the story about Peter and John healing the lame man as they go to the temple, the gate beautiful. And they get called to account for that. And after healing the lame man, it says that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, tells Jewish rulers that Jesus is the stone they rejected 
who has become the cornerstone. And he shows it to mean that Jesus has become the only way of salvation. Listen to what he says. Rulers and elders of the people, know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The only way of salvation, the cornerstone, which you rejected, you killed him. Then Jesus, by and large, was rejected by his own people, the Jews. John 1 verse 11 to 12 says that he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Interestingly, Jesus predicted that although they rejected him, there would come a time in the future where they would accept the false claims of the Antichrist. In John 5 verse 43, he says, I've come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. And this is the reason why we believe that the Jews will believe that the Antichrist is the Messiah. Now, despite Jesus' love for the city of Jerusalem and its people, that would be the very place that he would be killed. And so, leading up to these events and the triumphal entry, as he approached Jerusalem, we are told that he weeps and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, because it would be 40 years later that that city and the temple would be destroyed by the Romans. And he says, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's quoting Psalm 118. Remember, that's what his disciples had said as he came in. But there's going to be a time in the future when Jesus will again enter Jerusalem through the same eastern gate, and then they will realize that he is the Messiah. And they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so Jerusalem rejected its Messiah. They stumbled over the stone of offense. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 8, 13 to 15. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So a prediction that Israel and Jerusalem would be stumbled by the cornerstone. Many in Israel were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for a king, but they didn't think they needed a savior. They believed that they were righteous in keeping the law. So they were, wanted the Messiah just to come and get rid of the Romans and to establish the kingdom and you know, get them back their independence so they weren't under foreign rule. They wanted a king. They didn't want a savior. Why? Because they had confidence in their ability to keep the law. And that is part of the stone of offense. And that's how Paul interprets it. So Paul quotes that same passage and look what he says here. Romans 9 verse 32 to 33. What shall we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. Listen to this. He says, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that will cause people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. But not only his people rejected him, many people in the world reject him. The world that he made. John 15 verse 18, Jesus said to his disciples, if the world hates you, 
keep in mind that it hated me first. Don't be surprised if the world hates you, Jesus says. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. And today, Jesus is still hated by many without reason. And his rejection is predicted in Isaiah 53. Remember the two passages that speak of the suffering Messiah, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 in particular. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. And so... It's amazing to think that he was rejected by the very world that he created. That's what it says in John 1 verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And that idea is expressed in this poem. It's also a hymn by F.W. Pitt, a pastor in London. I just want to read it to you on those lines that the creator was rejected. He writes, the maker of the universe as man for man was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bough which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened over his head, by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face, by his decree, was poised in space. The spear which spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years, but a new glory crowns his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. Then sixthly, Jesus was rejected by a friend. Some people have the idea that Judas was an enemy, but he wasn't. He was a friend, a close friend. In fact, if you read the account of the Gospels, the other disciples didn't even suspect him. When Jesus spoke of his betrayer, they were all saying, is it me? Is it me? When Judas got up to leave it, they thought he was going to, you know, uh, do some errand. They didn't suspect him. He was a friend of Jesus. And that's why Jesus says at the Last Supper, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I've chosen. But this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Someone who shares a meal with you is your friend. And again, he's quoting Psalm 41 verse 9, and listen to the whole thing. Psalm 41 verse 9 says, Even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. What a cruel betrayal to be betrayed by a friend for money. And Jesus still calls him friend when he leads the mob who arrest him. Matthew 26, 47 to 15, while he was still speaking, Judas one of the twelve arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him. The one I kiss, betrayed him with a kiss, is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, pretending to you know, be friendly, and kisses him. And you know what Jesus says? He says, Friend. 
exactly what you came for. He calls him his friend. Then the men uh, stepped aside, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And Jesus' words to Judas are, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? But the final and the worst rejection, especially for Jesus, comes from an even more surprising source. And that's when he was rejected by his own father on the cross. And that was, we know, as he took the sin of the world on him, the father turned his back on him. And so it says in Matthew 27, verse 45 to 46, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, that period of three hours, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. But my God, why have you forsaken me? No longer father. Remember, when he's first on the cross, Father, forgive them. Now he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the good news is that rejected stone became the most important cornerstone. And remember, Peter had quoted that passage when he stood before the Sanhedrin. Yeah, he quotes it in his epistle. And we saw that Paul also quoted it. And he says in 1 Peter 2, verse 4 to 8, as you come to him... The living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. There is, quoting the Septuagint. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's kephalai ganiya, which actually means the head of the corner. He's become the head of the corner. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And so what is the purpose of the cornerstone? When they erected a building, they had a specific large stone that was cut to perfect measures. You know why it had to be perfect? Because they would use that to align the corners of the building. So if the cornerstone wasn't perfect and it was skew or whatever, the rest of the building would be skew. And so it had to be a perfect cornerstone. All measures and directions were taken from that stone to ensure that the building was built square and to the correct measures. And it was also obviously part of the foundation, but that was primarily the reason why it's referred to as the perfect cornerstone. It had to be perfect. And so without Christ as the perfect cornerstone, our lives lack direction and they're not built square, if you want to think about it. But it has a greater application than just our lives as well. Isaiah predicted a precious cornerstone that God would lay in Jerusalem. Isaiah 28, verse 16 to 17. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. It's a good foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. So here we have a perfect cornerstone. and Because of that, we can have justice and righteousness. Christ, as the perfect cornerstone, ensures that the building is built on principles of justice and righteousness because he's perfect. And the bigger application is not just to our own lives because the cornerstone also holds together two walls. And Paul actually applies that as well in Ephesians to the fact that Christ joined into one body those who were formerly Jews and Gentiles. They were separated, and Christ, the perfect cornerstone, not only makes sure the building is square, not only is a good foundation, he joins together the two walls. And that, Listen to this. It's quite a long excerpt, but I think some people miss what Paul is saying here. Ephesians 2, verse 11 to 21, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, that's us, at that time you were separate from Christ 
excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenant of the promise. We weren't part of the covenant. Without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, that's Jews and Gentiles, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace in one body, that one body is the church, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. For through him we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens, citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Listen to what it says. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Acrogonius, the head of the corner. And it says in him, that's the cornerstone, the whole building is joined together. He joins the Jews and Gentiles into one body and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Strong's exhaustive concordance defines that, uh, defines that Greek word acrogonias as the chief corner or the capstone. It can also mean the capstone. It literally means in the Greek at the extreme angle or corner. And so Jesus is described as both a cornerstone and a capstone. Because remember it talks about he who falls on the stone. Um, you can fall on a cornerstone, you can't fall on a capstone. A capstone can fall on you. And so Roman archways, those of you who've been to Israel will know this, will know that it's built from two columns of carved stones, and the two sides arch in towards each other at the top, and in the top center there's a triangular-shaped capstone, and it balances the two sides of the arch against each other. It's a very important stone. And so both the cornerstone and the capstone are apt metaphors to describe the importance of Christ in the building. I showed you why the cornerstone is important. But the capstone at the top locks all the stones into position and it allows the arch of the vault to bear weight. They also did it in a vault. When you had the, a vault with a dome, you would have in the center there, it would be a round capstone. And it's not just a decorative stone used to finish off the corner of the building. It holds the entire structure together. If you remove it from the arch, the arch collapses. If you remove it from the vault, the round capstone, the dome will cave in on itself because it balances the weight against each other. Jesus is the capstone. So he's the cornerstone from whom we should take all our direction and be our standard of measure. But he's also the capstone that joins together what needs to be together and without whom our lives would collapse. And that's why to those who reject him, he will be a rock that makes them fall. You can't reject the cornerstone. You can't reject the capstone. The building will collapse. Barnes comments, the meaning of this is that if the foundation stone is not the means of their salvation, it will be of their ruin. It is not a matter of indifference whether they believe on him or not, whether they accept or reject him. They cannot reject him without the most fearful consequences to their souls. And so my final slide, what will you do with the cornerstone? Will you be like those who reject the cornerstone, which turns out to be the most important stone? John 3 verse 36, Jesus said that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And that's why Peter says of the cornerstone that to you who believe, the stone is precious. It's a precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Amen.